You realize that I'm just the warm-up back for Liz, okay? Uh, it, is a, as a, it is a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to uh, sponsor this conference. Uh, and I'm going to just give you a little bit of philosophy before we uh, get into this. I'll let you ponder that slide and what in the heck he's thinking about for the vision of soil health when you see runoff on the field. Um, but as we begin to look at our resources, we are at the crisis stage, in my opinion. We're really at the crisis stage of what are we going to do, either going left or going right, in terms of how do we preserve our resources as we go into the future. And we're, I'm going to explain that to you as we go through this. If we look at this vision of soil health and everything, and I see too many fields that look like this. I see too many fields that look like this in the spring. I see them look like this in late fall. I see them look like any time that we've got this problem that we call this changing climate. Uh, I was in a field last week in uh, Stockton, Illinois, which is just by Galena. Uh, they had 10 inches of rain in a short period of time. It's very similar to that Ankeny storm that we had. And there was fields and had absolutely no runoff with 10 inches of rain in four hours. We can improve our soils. We can make them resilient to the types of climate that we're facing today. And if we don't do that, ding darlings, cartoons are gonna become even more true for us. So we're gonna launch into this. Uh, I'm at that point in my career that I can step on toes. Uh, uh, I told uh, Linda this morning that she asked me what was how things were going. I said, well, you know, I'm still here. Uh, you know, and if I raise some particular mm -hmm. hackles, what are they going to do? Fire me? Uh, so, you know, we'll just leave it at that. Uh, we're going to start with this. Uh, here's our vision, my vision for soil health. And that is we want no erosion across the state. We want infiltration rates of uh, in excess of four inches per hour. We want a healthy soil biology. I'm going to turn this so I can see that slide. Uh, we want to reduce need for pesticides and fertilizers and we want pr improved production efficiency. Uh, that's my vision for how Iowa ought to look in the future. And if agronomy does not get to that point, shame on us. That's the reality of how we need to be thinking about this problem. But, the characteristics that get us there, let's see. Push that. Characteristics that's going to get us there is that we need covers throughout the year. We're going to have to diversify our crop rotations. We're going to have to reduce our tillage. And we're going to have to change our attitude towards soil. And this latter part is probably the most problematic. We have an attitude problem. We have an attitude problem in agriculture. And that attitude problem is really boils down to this. That attitude problem is that we can apply things to the soil that make us efficient in production, preserve our yields, but never consider the whole system. We want in agriculture the easy button, that we can put something on that solves all of our problems. I'm sorry, it doesn't work that way. Uh, it just doesn't work that way. If we look at this, here's the reality. The reality is that we produce two crops. And the numbers on here is that in 19, or 2017, we produced in excess of 20 million acres of corn and soybeans out of a total of 23 uh, million, 26 million acres. That's 87% of this state is in two crops. The other reality is that our current management practices are acceptable in terms of soil management. The other piece is that we tolerate erosion. It's very good. People don't have any uproar about that first slide that I showed you. They don't say, well, what's going on? 
We accept that and say, well, it's because it rained too hard. <laughs> it's because we had this. We, it's because we had that. We tolerate that, and we need to come to a point of intolerance uh, about an erosion. The other piece is that we need to think we're doing a good job because yields have continued to increase. Our yields continue to go up. You know, we're, we've been pumping around whether we're going to have record yields yet this year. Uh, that may drop back a little bit. But we pat ourselves on the back and say, gee, we're doing a good job because our yields continue to increase. But at what cost? And the other piece that just drives me absolutely bonkers is this last one is that we consider any change beyond what we're currently doing as a fringe idea. <laughs> that you must be an absolute wacko <laughs> if you're doing anything beyond what we currently do today. Because it's got us here, yields are here, and all these different things, but if we're really honest with ourselves, and we start looking at Efficiency in terms of profitability, efficiency in terms of our return on our natural resource base, whether how much crop we're getting per amount of fertilizer, how much crop we're getting per amount of water, how much crop we're getting per amount of sunlight, all those different things, is we find out that there are parts that are pretty inefficient in our system. Some of you know this, I've told that if we want to change agriculture, we need to rip out every yield monitor and replace it with a profit monitor. Because if farmers could see the fact that they have variation in profit as they went across the field, I guarantee I could change farming practices in one year. If we don't make that honest assessment about what's going on. So we look at all these different pieces in this, and I'm just going to show you a couple slides just to drive this couple points home. Here's the, uh, here's corn planted in Iowa and on by a county by county basis and everything else and you can just see how intense we are uh, across this state. Uh, if you look at this, uh, the next one is just soybean production. Uh, that set drives that point home uh, in all of this. But then, I'll make it this way. Those are those two crops, that 23 million acres out of that 26 million acres of total land. And you go, and that's by order of acreage, you go corn, soybeans, and then we finally get to some grasslands, we get the alfalfa, and then we get the oats. But you have a hard time picking out any of those colors of big on one and two. <laughs> and so in our state, because we have these two crops, we have some particular issues that are going on in terms of how are we managing our soil resource uh, from this perspective. So we look at this vision and we go forward in all these different things. I'm going to go back to a, a slide that I've used before and this is what I call the soil degradation spiral. And that is that I'm going to let you put your definition of what you think poor land management is up on that. I have a whole series of definitions that I put with that. But the first thing that changes in soil when we begin to abuse it is the aggregate stability that initial aggregate size between the soil and the atmosphere, that upper half inch of the soil, and we tend to think about a six inch depth, but in reality it's the upper half inch that causes all of our problems in terms of what's going on. Because as we begin to change our soils and we reduce the aggregate stability is when we begin to see water and wind erosion, because those, those aggregates are no longer stable, uh, they begin to flake, they begin to slake, and then they begin to move down the stream and all of this. Um, once we begin to erode soils, we see all that variation of production across the field. Once we're no longer feeding that, we see a, a reduction in the soil biology, so we're no longer creating aggregates, we continue to destroy those aggregates. Our yields begin to decrease, and all of a sudden we've got reduced soil productivity, and we wonder where it went. And it's a slippery slope. You look at all these different pieces in this, and so you look at this dynamic of what goes on, and if you look at a field basis and you begin to look at the variation of soils within our fields, this is just on water holding capacity alone, and all these different pieces that are out there, 
those soils that have low water holding capacity have low yield potential because water is our number one problem that limits productivity across Iowa. And it's access to water late in the growing season. And if you can't store the water within that soil profile, you don't have a yield. And we can see yields decrease, all those different things that happen in that process. We have a crisis in terms of how do we begin to look at Iowa soils and say, how do we begin to change this path that we're on? How do we begin to change the path that we're on in terms of improving our soils, looking at them from a different perspective? But before we get there, I'm going to give you one more piece of the puzzle. This is a little study that we did. This is 16 years, actually 17 growing years of data. This is a very intense experiment across the a traditional corn soybean rotation. Uh, that field flops back and forth. Um, this, this field will be in corn one year, soybeans, and it just flips back and forth. All of these points right here is a soil sampling grid that we put on at 150 foot grid. So that we have a point every 150 feet to a depth of five feet. And then we've divided every one of those soil cores into six inch depth increments. But I'm only showing you the, the points that are part of the, the flux tower measurements because we related the carbon exchange measurements that we make uh, over these fields. And it's only within the footprint of that because we actually have sampled that grid across all of that field. Uh, and so we pretty well know that field. We sampled it in 2005. We sampled it again in 2016. But what we begin to find is that in what we consider an acceptable farming practice in Iowa is losing 1,000 pounds of carbon per acre per year. So if you farm 40 years, Ray, you've lost 40,000 pounds of carbon out of that soil. 20 tons. You have dramatically changed the organic matter content. You've changed the surface of that soil. You've changed all the things that go on that are positive within that by what we consider an acceptable farming practice. Just to scare you, because that's my job, <laughs> is if you run silage corn, the loss is 4,000 pounds per acre per year. So we've, we've begun to look at this whole process from an entirely different perspective. The process is really how do we begin to think about these dynamics in all of this. This carbon loss is intolerable uh, in terms of this because it makes that surface very uh, vulnerable to all the things that are going on. And so I'm just going to use a little cartoon slide of why this becomes important. Because in reality, how we begin to think about this is how do we manage our water. We tend to think about, well, we manage water with tile drains, we manage water with all this, but in reality, it's how do we manage water into that soil. The slide on the left is when you have a really low biologically active soil, that we may have some aggregates at that surface, but they're very unstable. As soon as raindrops hit them, they begin to dissolve. Once they dissolve into sand, silt, and clay, they move down through that and they clog up all the pores, basically like you've clogged up all the pipes in your house, and you all know what happens when you clog up the sewer pipe in your house. Uh, same thing happens in the soil, is when you clog up all those pores, where's water gonna go? Doesn't go down anymore, it goes off. And we have a lot of soils in across the Midwest that have less than one half inch of infiltration per hour. When's the last time you had a half inch rain per hour? <laughs> yeah, now you know the problem. What I keep telling producers is it's not how much rain you get in the rain gauge, it's how much rain you get in the soil. 
if you got a two-inch rain, but three-fourths or an inch and a quarter runs off, you only got three-fourths of an inch of rain. We need a different dynamic of how we think about our processes out there. That slide on the right is if we have a really active soil, active biological soil, those aggregates are extremely stable. We hit them with raindrops. They don't dissolve. Water moves down through that profile. If I can get water into the soil, I can store water within the soil. But I can't store water that's moving down the Skunk River or the Raccoon or the Des Moines or any other river across the state because it moves everything with it. Because once that gets clogged on the right side, that's where erosion begins to occur. We move it all off and we see that and everything else. Producers always ask me what the optimum soil health test is. What's the best thing I can do for soil health? My answer, which drives everybody nuts that works in soil health, is very simple. Go out in your field and look after two inch heavy rain and tell me what the surface looks like. Because if you can't absorb two inches of heavy, uh, rain without seeing some rivulets out there, you don't have soil health. Everything else is academic because we see those pieces in this. If you look at this, this is a uh, little study that actually Ken Walker, one of my postdocs, did while he was at the University of Iowa, just looking at runoff rates on different parts of this, contours, tilling parallel or perpendicular to the slope, uh, no-till and everything else. You see all those changes and how rapidly erosion occurs uh, in these dynamics and everything else. But what I want to spend a little bit of time on is our path forward. <laughs> How do we really get to begin to think about this changing dynamic of soils and what we can do with it? Because we got to think about it, and, and Neil asked us to consider what's our vision for going forward. And I'm going to just do this, and some of you have seen this slide and everything else, is that biology trumps physics and chemistry in the soil. You don't build soil back up without creating a home for the biology to work. We have to have that biology. That biology cycles our organic matter, it, it releases nutrients and all these different things. Those are those invisible processes that you see. Uh, and then you see them visually in terms of these dynamics. Improved aggregate structure at the surface, improved uh, water storage capacity, all these different things. But it all begins with how do we begin to promote biology within the system. Gardeners know that. A lot of producers know that. But the bulk of that 23 million acres that we have in corn and soybeans across Iowa have not recognized just the value of soil biology. We're going to have to figure out how do we get those convinced to be able to do that. So I'm going to show you just a couple little things. Here's an experiment that we've done. We do a lot of things in controlled chambers. The reason we do them in controlled chambers is because I can't handle that weather variation that's going on outside. <laughs> uh, so we, that's a core of soil that's roughly 18 inches by roughly 24, 30 inches in depth and everything. Uh, that's about 300 plus pounds of soil in there. They're highly instrumented with CO2, oxygen, water, temperature. Uh, we collect all the things that, that actually ooze out of roots in that thing. Um, I keep a lot of undergraduates busy uh, just measuring things for us in all of this. But what we did in all of this is we ran a little experiment, and each one of those cores is divided into pies. Uh, it's divided into thirds, and it, one of those thirds we didn't put any cover crop on. And the other third we put an oat cover crop, just a monoculture, and the other third we put an oat, a legume, and a mustard, a brassica species. That simple little cocktail of cover crops. The results are pretty interesting in all of this uh, because they're more dramatic than what you might expect. This is just the oxygen and CO2 levels. The orange line up there is that cocktail. The blue line in the center is the uh, monoculture oat, and the black line is no cover crop. 
The most important element that we have that we never talk about in soils is oxygen. And when we begin to go to that cocktail, we improve the oxygen piece of all this. Everybody goes, looks in the spring and says, gee, you know, there's a lack of nitrogen in this crop because it's yellow out there. It's not yellow because of lack of nitrogen. It's yellow because of lack of oxygen. Our soils and their current aggregate structure don't allow oxygen exchange back and forth within that. The reason that CO2 levels are so high is we promoted biological activity beyond belief within that soil. And we saw a major change in the biological activity uh, in all of this. And in one 40-day growing season of that cover crop, we already began to change the aggregates. Soils respond very quickly to what we do. We took those aggregates back out of that surface ran them through some rainfall simulators to see how stable they were, all those different things. We're changing soils. It's not a decadal process, people. It's a monthly process. And we can begin to change that in very dramatic ways. We did another little sampling. So what happens when you got a lot of people around that you can do this. We sampled another set of fields because that field that we had the changes on of that thousand pounds of carbon per acre loss per year. We took in another field and begin, we instrumented it in 2016 and we converted that system to a cover crop no-till system beginning in the fall of 2016. We intensively grid sampled that field. Again at 150 feet grids by five foot divided them all into six inch cores. Uh, just to put it in perspective for you that's about, when we got all done, it's about 300,000 analyses that we've done on that field uh, in all of this. But I'm just going to show you one piece of this because it becomes important. The one on the left is the dry aggregate stability uh, when we sampled in 2016. The one on the right is the dry aggregate stability after one year of going to the cover crop no-till system. We already saw a change in that field after one year for two reasons. One is that we kept more cover on that field during the early spring. The other piece that was very dramatic is we reduced the tillage. When we reduced the tillage, we began to change the aggregate stability across that field very dramatically uh, in all of these different pieces. Agricultural systems are this. They really convert water, light, nutrients into usable products. That's really what they do. Sorry to boil it down so simple for you, but that's really what they do uh, in all of this. But we need to start thinking about agriculture in the context of the ecosystem. We tend to think agriculture as within the confines of a 160 acre field or 320 acre field. We think about it, but we don't think about it in the context, the overall ecosystem that it fits in. So I've been pondering this for a long time about how do we begin to get there and all of this. And so this is how we need to think about agriculture. I've decided to make a diagram so complex that you can't take it apart. See, this is my whole view of this. Part of our problems in agriculture is that we tend to slice it off. We tend to think about the nutrient reduction strategy be about how we manage nitrogen. But in reality, the nutrient reduction strategy should be how do we manage water and how do we manage the soil resource and all of this. If you just look at this, and the reason we put this together is that those outside Mickey Mouse ears uh, are the ecosystem functions that we need to be considering uh, in all of this. But the agricultural systems exist within the context of that. And how do we look at things that we want to preserve within our ecosystem? This has been our whole philosophy of how do we change the dynamics of, of how we view our research, but how's the context in which we put that in. There's some things that we have to make some changes in in agriculture. We've got to start valuing 
the fact that we need to enhance our soil health in terms of the biology, in terms of the nutrient cycling, because if we begin to change that, we see a much more efficient system in terms of the utilization of water nutrients like the things that we convert water in, or crops into. This conversion process, and we can see we can improve that efficiency, all that. That field that we converted, within one season we're already begun to see a change in the carbon dynamics of that field because we just reduced the tillage piece of it. I think there's one other change that we're going to make and I'm going to throw it out to you and then you can throw things back at me. Uh, but I believe we're going to have to change our whole structure of how we think about fertilizer management in our crops. And I just wonder at times that we just don't need to completely ban anhydrous ammonia across the state. It's not just the fall application of it, it's the application of it in general. And I had this come up to me last week in looking at fields and everything else. And most of you, some of you have forgotten, some of you don't know, is the original application of anhydrous ammonia was for what purpose? Airport runways. Air, building airport runways. And how much corn do you grow on an airport runway? <laughs> the reason I say that and the reason why I'm thinking of this, and I'll throw it out to you because it's a relatively safe audience, uh, <laughs> is that anhydrous ammonia is probably one of our major culprits in destroying aggregate structure and stability of that soil surface. So we need to begin to think about what we have in fertilizer management practices across the state in order to do this. Are we doing one thing that promotes that and, and offsetting it just on the other side? And so I'll throw that out for you for discussion in all of this. It gets a little bit radical, but maybe it's something we need to start thinking about. Are we doing the right thing in terms of how we're managing our crops from all different perspectives? But I do know that we need to diversify our rotations. We need to start thinking about all these different pieces in this puzzle and thinking about it from this perspective rather than just, we tend to think about just this block. But in reality, we gotta put it in a larger context. So with that, I'll entertain some questions. We have time for probably one or two questions from Jerry, if they're short, or if you can, who has a question? Did you till your cover crop with glyphosate? Nope. I have completely, <laughs> I have completely moved away from glyphosate. I've been reading too many books and, and too much information, you know, that I, I think that a lot of our chemicals are not only with anhydrous, I think a lot of this, uh, some of our fungicides, some of our things, we're making our crops more susceptible to all the diseases uh, that we have going on. Uh, we tend to think we're protecting, but we're actually making them more susceptible. Um, so yes, we've moved completely away from that. I'm even trying to move farther away uh, from my, all chemicals. Oh, yeah, I, we have, oh, yes. Um, what other crops can we grow besides corn and beans? There are a lot of different things. I mean, you, you look at alley cropping, you look at agroforestry, we've got trees as part of this landscape, and you know, we bulldoze down more trees than we plant in the state. Um, and I think that there are a lot of things that we can do, uh, and we're gonna have to figure out how do we uh, help develop markets for those. Uh, I think it becomes, 
and economic incentive, and this is one of the things that maybe the Iowa Economic Development Council ought to get much more engaged in saying what do we do for products in the state uh, in terms of really beginning to help and say, if we want to diversify the state, what do we do to promote the different things that are going on? We have to have a project on pecans and, and alley cropping in Arkansas that we're working on, showing great advantages of all this, both from the livestock as well as the, the tree perspective as well. Livestock is a major piece of this. In fact, one of the things that we see when we begin to put manure back in that system, they are a great advantage in terms of recycling those nutrients. A lot of things that, where guys are running cover crops and running livestock with them, tremendous advantage. Uh, in all of this in terms of the dynamics. We need to bring and begin to figure out how do we u effectively utilize livestock in this state as part of our soil management practice. And with that, I'll stop. But <laughs> Let's thank uh, Jerry. Uh